Hi everyone, this is Ray. I uh, post songs online under the title uh, Singing Talit. Um, I've been reading in The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim over the last few weeks. And I took a little break. I ordered a lapel mic. Hopefully that'll help clear up the sound quality. And uh, I'm going to test it out today while reading chapter 4. Um, if anyone would like to join in, feel free to post any questions. They'll come up on the computer or on the phone as I'm recording. And uh, let's get into it. Chapter 4 is titled, Philo of Alexandria, the Rabbis and the Gospels, the final development of Hellenism in its relation to Rabbinism and the Gospel according to John. Now, as a little primer from what we've been talking about, uh, basically, uh, Alfred Edersheim, um, when he was eight years old, his family converted from Orthodox Judaism uh, into the Anglican Church. He was considered at his time, which this book was written in the 1880s, uh, he was considered the world's leading scholar on Jewish thought and its relationship to uh, Christianity and uh, what was going on in first century uh, Christendom, well I guess I shouldn't say Christendom, but Judea at the time, and what was going on with the Jews at this time uh, with the division between the, the Western uh, mindset, which was more geared towards the Greek thought, and then the Eastern mindset, which was more geared towards the uh, Rebbenism coming out of Babylon, where famous uh, Babylonian rabbis such as Hillel lived, and uh, the influence of Babylon was very great into Jerusalem, but west of Jerusalem it wasn't so great, and more the, the thoughts of the Greeks were very prominent there. And there was, a, at the time, a kind of <clears throat> melding and fusing of Western Greek thought with the thought of Judaism, uh, even to the point where rabbis at the time who were studying Greek thought, many of them doing it under the table, so to speak, were, were coming to ask themselves questions. How did these you know, great Greek philosophers come up with these certain truths that they were starting to realize about existence and about reality and about the way the world worked. And they said, well, obviously they must have learned something from Moses at some point. So somehow they were attempting to justify this. A lot of writings were coming out at this time. They're called uh, uh, pseudepigraphal writings or apocrypha type writings like the Book of Enoch, which uh, there's a lot of uh, an attempt in these works to fuse the thoughts of the Greek world into the thoughts of the, the Jewish world at the time. And that's what's been being discussed so far. It is kind of giving us a primer for understanding the mindset of the people at the time. Uh, now, many of us know about the, the Maccabean Revolt and how Greek thought had become very prominent in Israel at the time, uh, brought in when they were actually under the control of the Greeks, uh, the uh, Seleucid kings, such as Antiochus Epiphanes. The civil war that erupted because of that caused a, a real division between the people. Um, but at the end of the day, the Maccabees did win. Um, unfortunately, the Hasmonean dynasty, which was established thereafter, um, and of course the Hasmoneans were not technically kings, they were, the, the word is ethnarch for the type of rulership that they had. And what this rulership really means is that uh, Antiochus decided it was best to allow them to self-govern. That doesn't mean he's not paying them taxes, or sorry, that they aren't paying him his taxes. It just means they're being allowed to govern themselves. And the Hasmonean dynasty grew out of that. And of course, that was toppled by uh, Augustus Caesar. And Herod the Great was put on the throne in their place. He was an Idumean king who replaced the Hasmoneans. But he still married into the, the line of the Hasmoneans. The, uh, in fact, the famous... Um, what was her name, uh, wife of his brother Philip, which John the Baptist was so well known for saying he, he had no right to marry his, his, his brother Philip's wife. She was actually a Hasmonean princess, which would make her a Levite. She was from the tribe of Levi and related to the Maccabees in that sense. Not that that's the actual name. Maccabee actually means hammer, but uh, the Hasmonean, Hasmonean was, their, was their actual name. So chapter four here. <clears throat> It is strange how little we know of the personal history of the greatest of uninspired Jewish writers of old. Though he occupied so prominent a position in his time, Philo was born in Alexandria about 20 years before Christ. He was a descendant of Aaron and belonged to one of the wealthiest and most influential families among the Jewish merchant princes of Egypt. 
His brother was the political head of that community in Alexandria, and he himself on one occasion represented his co-religionists, though unsuccessfully at Rome, and that's in around 3 to 40 A.D., as the head of an embassy to entreat Emperor Caligula for protection from the persecutions consequent on the Jews resisting to placing, uh, resistant to placing statues of the emperor in their synagogues. But it is not with Philo, the wealthy aristocratic Jew of Alexandria, but with the great writer and thinker who, so to speak, complete Jewish Hellenism that we are here to do. Let us see what his relation alike to heathen philosophy and to Jewish faith, or both of which he was an ardent advocate, and how in his system he combined the teachings of the two. So we're talking about Philo of Alexandria. Alexandria is a city uh, on the west side of Egypt. Uh, it was known as uh, the, the home of the Great Library of Alexandria, uh, which some of you may remember from world history class in high school, if you, if you took world history. Um, it was a storehouse of all the knowledge that was in the Orient at the time, and unfortunately it was burned to the ground, and uh, the majority of those works were lost. But the, the largest Jewish community outside of Jerusalem, uh, to the west of Jerusalem, was living there. So Philo was a famous historian and a writer and a Jewish thinker at this time who was attempting to help explain that uh, the, that division that was happening where Greek thought was entering into Jewish thought and he was basically trying to show that a lot of these Greek ideas were actually already in the Jewish mindset and a lot of the Jewish ideas were completely compatible with some of the Greek ideas uh, like we read in a couple chapters ago uh, considering like the philosophy of Stoicism. Stoicism is a, a very aesthetic religion which is uh, to say that it's all about denial of the self, denying the flesh, you know you don't drink, you don't have sex, you don't do anything that's pleasurable to the flesh because by neglecting these things you can achieve a higher uh, spiritual plane or a higher form of spiritual development. Um, that had its place in Jewish thought at the time. So let's read more about Philo. To begin with, Philo united in rare measure Greek learning with Jewish enthusiasm. In his writings he very frequently uses classic modes of expression. He names not fewer than 64 Greek writers and he either alludes to or quotes frequently from such sources as Homer, Hesiod, Pindar, Solon, and great Greek tragedians, uh, Plato, and others. To him these men were scarcely heathens. He had sat at their feet and learned to weave a system from Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics. The gathering of these philosophers were holy, and Plato was the great. But holier than all was the gathering of the true Israel, and the incomparably greater than any, Moses. From him had all sages learned, and with him alone was all truth to be found, not indeed in the letter, but under the letter of the Holy Scripture. In Numbers 23.19 we read, quote, God is not a man, and in Deuteronomy 1.31, that the Lord was as a man, did not imply, on the one hand, the revelation of absolute truth by God, and on the other, the accommodation of those who were weak? Here, then, was the principle of a twofold interpretation of the word of God, the literal and the allegorical. The letter of the text was to be held fast. The biblical personages and histories were real, but only narrow-minded slaves of the letter would stop here, the more so as sometimes the literal meaning alone would be tame, even absurd, while the allegorical interpretation gave the true sense, even though it might occasionally run counter to the letter. Thus, the patriarchs represented states of the soul, and whatever the letter might bear, Joseph represented one given to the fleshly, whom his brothers rightly ha hated, Simeon, the soul aiming after the higher, the killing of the Egyptian by Moses, the subjugation of the passions, and so on. But this allegorical interpretation by the side of the literal, that is to say, the Peshat of the Palestinians, that's, just, that's the, of the four types of understanding Peshat is one of those, um, though only for the few was not arbitrary. It had its, quote, laws and, quote, canons, some of which excluded the literal interpretation while others admitted it by the side of the higher meaning. And he's basically saying, and this is something you see in the Jewish tradition today, is the idea that... Um, if you read the text, there's the, the, the level of what you're reading, which is just the, the, the plain lettering of the story and whatever the story is that you're reading and the plain words of it. 
And then the question of what is the allegorical meaning of the story? And then, of course, you can go on farther and to take it into what is the, the meaning of the gematria of the different letters and then what, what would be a, a Zohar-inspired, because they actually consider the Zohar to be the real uh, Torah and that the, the Torah is more like a, uh, an, a, an abbreviation, a reorganization of the Zohar, and the Zohar is the actual correct order in which things should be learned. Um, all in all, what we see here um, is that he's using rabbinical thought at the time to show how there's no reason that some of these um, the Greek stories and some of their quote-unquote deeper um, philosophical meanings aren't even present in what's already in the Jewish literary tradition. For instance, and I talked about this in the last Torah portion, um, Moses defeating the Egyptians being the subjugation of passion. Uh, when I read the last Torah portion and spoke about it, when Pharaoh is, is talking about pursuing the Israelites through the, uh, through the waters to chase after him, he said, I'm going to satisfy my lusts upon them, which is saying I'm going to satisfy my flesh when I get a hold of them. And uh, you could look at that as, as even having a sexual meaning. Uh, and that's why he's, uh, that Philo's saying, even in our own writings, we have these uh, deeper meaning stories. For instance, you have to learn how to, how to push down your own fleshly desires so that you can come to become a, a greater uh, understander of what it is that God has got for you. Um, so that's what he's trying to push in, in a lot of his writings at the time. To, he's kind of trying to bring this Greek world and the Jewish world together and kind of not necessarily in a way to destroy Judaism, but in a way to make it where there doesn't have to be this, this conflict and this, this endless fighting between the Greek philosophy, which is based on reason, which has a great appeal to anyone who learns anything about it. Uh, it's appealing because it's based on the concept that uh, it's the, the foundation of logic is A cannot be not A and A simultaneously. That's the foundation block of all logic. It's simply that you, you can't say that a blue car is a blue car and not a blue car simultaneously. Because if you do that, then things lose their coherentness and they, they can no longer be ex dis discussed in a sensible manner. So he's basically trying to get, to try to get, get them moved past this divide and show how that deep, intelligent, logical tr tradition is built into the understanding that Israel has. To begin with the former, the literal sense must be wholly set aside when it applied, when it implied anything unworthy of the deity, anything unmeaning, impossible, or contrary to reason. Manifestly, this canon, if strictly applied, would do away not only with the anthropomorphisms, but cut the knot wherever difficulty seemed insuperable. Again, Philo would find an allegorical, along with the literal, interpretation indicated in the reduplication of a word and in seemingly superfluous words, particles, or expressions. This could, of course, only bear such a meaning on Philo's assumption of the actual inspiration of the Septuagint version. Similarly, in exact accordance with the Talmudic canon, and this is from Baba K. 64b, any repetition of what had been earlier stated would point to something new. And this is a, um, a common uh, thing you'll learn about when you study uh, Orthodox Judaism, which is the idea that if God said something more than once in the Scriptures, because it has a different meaning than it did the first time it was said. For instance, three times it says, do not uh, boil a calf in its mother's milk. So the first time, it's meant to be read literally. Don't boil a calf in its mother's milk, because this is a, a practice of the uh, Canaanites to worship their gods. Second time, however, it must have another meaning. And I'm not saying that this is the case, but this is what... Um, Judaism teaches. The new meaning then of course is that you don't um, eat milk and meat together. You don't, you don't cook cheese or anything. That's why Jews don't eat cheeseburgers because they can't mix milk with their meat and then they take it to the next step when it comes again and then they have what you call the parv bakery which is where you don't even bake goods. Uh, you don't even eat baked goods with milk in them. Um, in fact when I lived in Pittsburgh I lived in the uh, Jewish community there without even knowing anything about it and I went to the Parv Bakery and uh, bought some Parv Baked Goods and I, I did not enjoy them. They, they, I did not find them to be tasty. So I only bought um, a, Parv, um, a Parv cookie one time and, and after that I went with the non-Parv items. 
Let's see. So, reduplication of a word, the Talmudic canon, uh, that each time it's sa- it stated, it would point to something new. These were comparatively sober rules of exegesis. Not so the license which he claimed of freely altering the punctuation of sentences and his notation that if one from among several synonymous words was chosen in a passage, these pointed to some special meaning attached to it. Even more extravagant was the idea that a word which occurred in the Septuagint might be interpreted according to every shade of meaning which it bore in the Greek. Interesting. And that even another meaning might be given to the slight alteration of the letters. See, that's, in, that's interesting. I, I wasn't even aware that that was a, a concept at the time. But what he's saying is that during this time when uh, Philo of Alexandria is talking about the, the Torah and the Septuagint, he's saying that the translation of, of the Hebrew into the Greek Septuagint was so precise and so divinely inspired that you could even take the different meanings of Greek words and apply them to what was in the text, which people, I mean, we commonly do that when we read it in the Hebrew not that I can read Hebrew, but I can read the Strong's Concordance, and it tells me the Hebrew words, but lots of the Hebrew words have multiple meanings, and there are multiple ways in which you can translate what something is talking about when you're reading it. So he's, he's taking it as far as to say that even the Septuagint could be treated in that same way. That's not something I would agree with, by the way. However, like other of Philo's allegorical canons, these were also adopted by the rabbis and the Haggadic interpretations were frequently prefaced by, and this is a quote, read not thus, but thus, unquote. If such violence might be done to the text, we need not wonder at interpretations based on a play upon words or even upon parts of a word. Of course, all seemingly strange and peculiar modes of expression or of designation occurring in Scripture must have their special meaning, and so also every particle, adverb, or preposition. Again, the position of a, ver- of a verse, its succession by another, the apparently unaccountable presence or absence of a word might furnish hits, hints of some deeper meaning, and so would an unexpected uh, singular for a plural, or vice versa, the use of a tense, even the gender of a word, most serious of all, an allegorical interpretation might be again employed as the basis of another. And, of course, he's basically saying to us that, and this is common among the rabbis, you'll see them, for instance, um, in the Torah portion where the children of Israel arrive at Sinai. It says that they seize the thunderings and the lightnings and the sound of a trumpet. It didn't say they heard those sounds. It says they seize. It didn't say they saw. It's not, it's, not, it's not past tense, even though it's referring to something that happened in the past. It's actually in present tense, and it says they seize it happen. And uh, what Philo is pointing out is that any, any time there's, there's things like that that are occurring, even in the Septuagint, there's no need for us not to take it even farther to understanding things in some you know, spiritual or multiple you know, meaning interpretation of the way things are happening. Uh, and again, this is common. Rabbis do this all the time today. For instance, there are certain times when David is written differently than it, you'd see it originally written. Like the, I think this, I think it misses an ein at some point. And it, when it's missing an ein, it has a, a, a different spiritual meaning, though it's actually talking about the same King David. Um, and that's not something that I understand deeply, because again, I don't understand the gematria, but. To a scholar of Jewish literature, to a Jewish scholar of the Torah, to a rabbinical teacher, all these are tools to understand and decode the meaning that are actually hidden in the Torah. And what Philo's saying is, hey, let's take it even into the Greek language. Let's do it also with the Septuagint, which is the Greek uh, translation, because it's probably as far as he's concerned, it's, it's a holy document itself. We repeat that these allegorical canons of Philo are essentially the same as those of the Jew- the Jewish traditionalism in the Haggadah. And we talked about the, um, the Haggadic or the Haggadah before, which is the, um, the, the, the teachings and principles that are taught. Um, there's the Halakha, which is the walk, as it said. Like, for instance, in Hebrew, Halakha is walk. So God Halakha with Adam in the garden. He walked with Adam in the garden. So you could say that it implied that he trained Adam how to walk appropriately or taught him the Torah which is what most rabbis would tell you. 
is that he, that he learned the Torah, he learned the halakha, he learned how to walk. So you take that forward and the rabbis teach their walk, which is their halakha, or the Jewish law, which um, you see Yeshua debating a few, a few points sometimes with him. He doesn't always just flat out disagree with him because I'm sure we would know if he disagreed all the time. But he's got a lot of, um, a lot of problems with certain halakhic laws that, that govern certain behaviors that are, that are not accurate according to the Torah. For instance, when him and his disciples go into the field and they pick the wheat and eat it, the, the Pharisees, which are the rabbis of the time, say, you're violating the law of the Sabbath because you're out there picking that wheat in the field and that's doing work. And of course, he replies to them, well, then you probably think that the priests in the temple are violating the Sabbath right now because they're doing their jobs in the temple. And as far as you're concerned, they're not allowed to do that. So th these are places where the halakha or the, the, the haggadah, which is the teachings of the individual rabbis about their interpretations of what things mean, uh, and the halakha, which is the teachings of the rabbis together, or the traditions of Israel. Um, we see them teaching to create this wall around the Torah, as they call it, this hedge of protection to, to keep people from violating the Torah. So they would teach the halakha, which is how to walk where you won't violate the Torah. And then you even had the Haggadic teachings of individual rabbis, which would say like, he, he would teach you something, he'd say, now listen, this is just my opinion, this is not canon, scripture, but this is the way I see that it to mean. And when certain rabbis, because of the great authority they had as learned men, sometimes those things ended up becoming halakha over time. All right, so um, what Philo's saying is, um, hey, why can't we do this with the, with the Septuagint too? All right, so the Jewish traditional, traditionalism in the Haggadah, only the letter were not rationalizing, and so far more brilliant in their application. In other respect, also the Palestinian had the advantage of the Alexandrian exegesis. Reverently and cautiously, it indicated what might be omitted in public reading and why, what expressions of the original might be modified by the Maturga man, and how, so as to avoid a like one danger by giving a passage in its literally, litera, literality, and another by adding to the sacred text or conveying a wrong impression of the divine being, or else giving occasion to the unlearned and unwary of becoming entangled in dangerous speculations. Jewish tradition here lays down some principles which would be of great practical use. Thus we are told in BER 31b, lots of times he um, cites the Talmud, uh, the Midrash, and other um, historical, spiritual Jewish writings, uh, to show how, I mean, he's not, this guy is not uneducated. This was the, the world-renowned scholar in Jewish thought as it related to, you know, Christianity at the time in the late 1800s. Um, he came from a family who was Orthodox Jew. When he was eight years old, they, create, they, they converted to the Anglican Church, but I'm sure he was still raised in the Jewish tradition. He probably still learned Hebrew. He probably still knew all about the Talmud, or at least when he, at least when he grew up, he became a, 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 a scholar of it, and he constantly quotes from the Talmud, quotes from the Midrash, quotes from different Targums. This, this is a learned scholar about the subject we're talking about. Thus we are told, the scripture uses the modes of expression common among men. This would, of course, include all anthropomorphisms. And if you don't, anthropomorphism means to make an object human-like. Anthro is man, so when you anthropomorphize something, you say, um, you give it the characteristics of being a human. Again, sometimes with considerable ingenuity, a suggestion is taken from a word, such as that Moses knew the serpent was to me made of brass from the similarity of two words, which are nechash, which is serpent in Hebrew, and nechosheth, which is brass. Uh, and this he's quoting from the Talmud. He said, in the Talmud, he said, that's how Moses knew what it was to be made of because the, the, when it's, they put that brazen serpent up, it was made of brass because the two words are so closely related, you would know that serpent and brass would go right together. Similarly, it is noted that Scripture uses euphemistic language so as to preserve the greatest delicacy. And again, he quotes the Talmud here. These instances might be multitude, but the above will suffice. Multi might be multiplied, but the above will suffice. So he's saying there's many more examples of cases of using um, this allegorical understanding of what's in the scriptures. Right? 
In his symbolic interpretations, Philo only partially took the same road as the rabbis. The symbolism of numbers, and so far as the sanctuary was concerned, that of colors and even materials may indeed be said to have its foundation in the Old Testament itself. The same remark applies partially to that of names. The rabbis certainly so interpreted them. But the application which Philo made of this symbolism was very different. Everything became symbolic in his hands. If it suited his purpose, numbers, and in a very arbitrary manner, in other words, he just kind of did it when he wanted to, burst, uh, sorry, beasts, birds, fowls, creeping things, plants, stones, elements, substances, conditions, and even sex. And so a term or an expression might even have several contradictory meanings from which the interpreter was at liberty to choose. From the consideration of this method by which Philo derived from scriptures his theological views, we turn to a brief analysis of these. And remember, this is Edersheim trying to, to help you understand that Philo of Alexandria, who was considered a great and learned man among the Jews at the time, at least west of Jerusalem, um, he was trying to reconcile these, the Greek world and the Jewish world as being okay to be side by side, even to mingle together, and that it wouldn't be a problem. And part of how he had to do it was he had to come up with some new ways of understanding what the word meant. All right, theology. This is an explanation of Philo's theology. In reference to God, we find, side by side, the apparent contradictory views of the Platonic and Stoic schools. Following the former, that's to say the Stoic school, the sharpest distinction was drawn between, go between God and the world. God existed neither in space nor in time. He had neither human qualities nor affections. In fact, he was without any qualities and even without any name. Hence, wholly uncognizable by man. Okay, that's the Stoic understanding of what God is. And you see a lot of that in the way people think about who or what God is today. We'll say, well, he's unknowable. Well, he exists outside of time. Well, well all, these are Stoic thoughts. These are the, the thoughts of Greek uh, philosophy being applied to the, the unseen God, the entity that you obviously, you can't wrap your head around comprehend it, but and yet when he's explaining the Torah, you can wrap your head around it. He's, I'm jealous. I want my wife, you know, he, he's, he's, he's a husband, he wants to have his bride, he wants to have his children, he wants to have his people, he wants to have people in obedience, you know, that is what he is, you know, it's like when he first describes himself, he says, you know, who are you, he says, I'm, I'm Yehovah, um, that's Yehovah, you know, that's, I'm Yehovah, Yehovah, you know, I, I, that's me, you, what does that mean, that's what he is, <laughs> drawn between God and the world, okay, so, in this uh, Stoic thought concerning what God was, they even said he didn't have a name. He was wholly uncognizable by man. That means your brain literally cannot think of what he is because he does not fit in what your brain can comprehend. Okay. Thus changing the punctuation and the accents, the Septuagint of Genesis 3.9 was made to read, quote, Adam, quote, thou art somewhere, unquote. But God had no somewhere, as Adam seemed to think when he hid himself from him. In the above sense also, Exodus 3.14 and 6.3 were explained, and the two names, Elohim and Yehovah, belonged really to two supreme divine potencies, while the fact of God's being incognizable appeared again in Exodus 20.21. 20, but side by side with this we have to save the Jewish, or rather the Old Testament idea of creation and providence, and the Stoic notion of God as imminent in the world, and that's to say he was om omnipresent, right? He's everywhere. And yet when we read in the Torah, you know, he shows up certain places, like uh, he goes to Abraham, he's, he's walking right past Abraham's house one day with his, you know, two angels, and Abraham's come inside, let me, let me serve you, you know. Um, but the Stoic mindset is that God is everywhere, and he's, you, you, can't, you can't contemplate his existence. He exists outside of time. He doesn't, he doesn't have a place where he is, because he, he is everywhere. Um, and again, these are all things you hear in the, the Christian church all the time, because these, these are Greek philosophical concepts that have been woven into Christianity. Um, let's see here. So in the Stoic notion, in fact, as that alone which is real in it, as always working, in short, to use his own pantheistic expression, and this is him quoting uh, Philo, quote, himself one and the all, unquote. 
Chief in his being is hid goodness, the forthgoing of which was the ground of creation. Only the good comes from him. With matter he can have nothing to do, hence the plural number in the account of creation. God only created the soul, and the only that, because that is good. In the sense of being eminent, God is everywhere. Nay, all things really are really only in him, or rather he is what is real in all. So, but chiefly is God the wellspring of light of the soul, its, quote, savior from the, quote, Egypt of passion. Two things follow. With Philo's ideas of the separation between God and matter, it was impossible always to account for miracles or interpositions. Accordingly, these are sometimes allegorized, sometimes rationalistically explained. Further, the God of Philo, wherever he might say, whatever he might say to the contrary, was not the God that Israel, which was not the God of that Israel, which was his chosen people. So he's saying that when you read the way Philo tries to explain who and what God is, and remember, this is a a very intelligent leader of the Jewish community in Alexandria. The way he describes God is not the way God, God is, ends up being described in the actual Torah, and is not the way he was thought of by the uh, the people in Palestine at his time, which that's what we call Israel. Well, I guess we would say Judea and Galilee and Samaria, but. Uh, and this is, the, this is the second point he's going to describe to us. So intermediary beings, because like, you remember he's, he, just, he just said the way he reads it, and this is Philo of Alexandria, he's saying that there's actually the two diff- God's actually two different potencies. That's why there's the Yahweh and Elohim, because he's two different potencies that, have, that are the creative power. And he only, the only thing he really created was the soul, and everything else is really him. Cause that, and that's why the... He literally called it pantheism because, um, oh gosh, what philosopher was it? He was a Jewish modern philosopher who, who came up with the concept of um, uh, pantheism, which is that God is everything, which obviously he didn't come up with because they were talking about it in the 1880s and all the way back in ancient Greece. But um, let's move on to the second point. The intermediary beings or potencies, and it actually has the Greek words here, but I cannot read ancient Greek, so... If in what has proceeded we have once and again noted a remarkable similarity between Philo and the rabbis, there is still more curious analogy between his teachings and that of Jewish mysticism, as ultimately fully developed in the Kabbalah. The very term Kabbalah, from Kibel, or to hand down, seems to point out not only its descent by oral tradition, but also its ascent to ancient sources. Its existence is presupposed, and its leading ideas are sketched in the Mishnah. The Targums also bear at least one remarkable trace of it. May it not be that, as Philo frequently refers to ancient tradition, so both Eastern and Western Judaism may here have drawn from one and the same source. We will not venture to suggest how high up, while each made such use of it suited their distinctive tendencies. At any rate, the Kabbalah also, likening scripture to a person, compares those who study merely the letter to them who attend only to the dress, those who consider the moral of the fact to them who attend to the body, while the initiated alone who regard the hidden meaning are those who attend to the soul. Again, as Philo, so the oldest part of the Mishnah, designates God as makum, or, quote, the place, the all comprehending what the Kabbalists call the Einsoft. And you may, and anyone's ever heard that, that's Einsoft. You may hear, you, I've heard modern day uh, Orthodox rabbis when they're in the middle of talking, they'll mention Einsoft when they're, when they're talking. That's, that's a, still a concept today. The boundlessness of, of God with, uh, with comprehending what the Kabbalists call the Einsoft, the boundless that God without any quality, well not, that is without any quality, who becomes cognizable only by his manifestations. Okay, so here we have the division between what is the, I got a question just popped up. What is the Mishnah? The Mishnah is a record of the oral traditions that were collected supposedly back from Sinai when the 40 elders went up on the mountain with Moses 
it said that God spoke not just to Moses but to all of them and they recorded the the utterances that God said to them and they kept exchanging it back and forth between them so they wouldn't forget them and this was handed down as the oral law or the uh, Torah by al pay, which is the, the oral Torah and eventually in about I think it's about 300 AD someone finally wrote it down uh, and these writings were called the Mishnah which then codified and made clear what the oral law was, what the oral Torah was, what the Halakha is supposed to be. So if you get a copy of the Mishnah, that is supposed to be what was said at Sinai that's not included in the Torah, because there are several uh, things mentioned in the Torah that there's really no explanation for how to, how to do them, because it's not explained in the Torah. For instance, uh, it says when you sacrifice an animal, you need to butcher them in the way I have said, and it doesn't say anywhere, so that's where we get the uh, the kosher butchering practices from. It's where they take the shika and they slice the animal's neck and bleed the blood out of it uh, and allow it to kind of slowly die without you know being terrified and scared. You know they put and they literally slice it. Uh, I think it's this jugular with a a razor sharp knife that just happens quick and then they step away and then the animal just slowly dies on its own bleeding out. It also gets the blood out of the body but it keeps them from dying in terror, you know, as well. And that's just one example of places, like for instance, when you go to Sukkot, it says you're supposed to bring a beautiful fruit, um, which can be understood to be a citrus fruit from what's in the text, but it doesn't really say exactly what citrus fruit. Uh, and it's understood because of the teachings of the oral Torah that this is an etrog, uh, which is a very particular fruit in the Middle East that costs a fortune when Sukkot time comes around because boy, the prices on them go up because you, number one, it's got to be a nice one, you know, and uh, because it's that time of year where they know they can sell them, the, the price on them jumps up. Uh, but that's, that's understood from the oral Torah or what's written in the Mishnah that that's what you need to bring. So that, that hopefully will help answer that question. Now, that is what the Mishnah is. So again, we're talking about um, Philo of Alexandria and we've just we've just talked about the Kabbalah and some of the um, the, the vision and the way the Kabbalists look at people. The Kabbalists look at the the person who just reads the word as somebody who might as well just be looking at the dress on somebody and saying, "Oh, that's who they are. Their dress." You know, they judge a book by its cover. Basically, is what they're trying to say. And then, if you actually are able to read, you know, the 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 deeper meanings of it, then they consider you to be somebody who you know, is capable of looking at a person and saying, oh, well, they're a, they must be a male or they're a female. or they, they know the general things about them, but they don't know them intimately because you have to be a Kabbalist to understand God intimately, you know, which is, and of course, there's the, the creation of a, of a mystical school, which is the same old, you know, cult of, the, uh, of those who are in the know and those who are not. So, unfortunately, that's, that's a common place in, in religions is that the formation of these groups or these cults or occultic group. Occult means hidden. That's literally what the word means. That's why I keep using the term cultic because someone who's in a cult is in a hidden group. What they do, they do in secret, and, they, and you've been warned you know, from the scripture. You, do, you, don't, you don't live your life in secret. You live out loud. You need, to, you need to make sure that you're not a person who hides what happens but that you reveal what happens. Uh, to speak the truth, the word truth in Greek literally means to take the cover off of something. Like Apocalypse, uh, which we define as Revelation, the book of Revelation. In the older Bibles, it'll be called the book of the Apocalypse because it means to remove the cover off of something so that people can see what is inside of it. You don't want to be a part of these groups, for instance, with this Kabbalah idea that uh, essentially if you've got to hide something from somebody who wants to know about the living God, you're, you're in the wrong place. That, stay away from that. Don't, don't, if someone tells you to hide something about God from somebody else because they're not ready for it or whatever, just don't be involved with that because we don't hide things. We, we proclaim the truth. That's, that's, that's what we do. So anyway, <clears throat> back to what Philo's talking about. The manifestations of God but neither Eastern mystical Judaism nor the philosophy of Philo could admit any direct contact between God and his creation. The Kabbalah, the Kabbalah solved the difficulty by their sephiroth, 
or the emanations of God, emanations from God, through which this contact was ultimately brought about and which was the Einsoft or crown was the spring. That is to say, every time God has appeared in creation, it wasn't really God. It was an emanation of God. The true God is Einsoft, this thing that you can't understand because you're not a Kabbalist who spent their life studying the Kabbalah. Um, but this wellspring of spiritual life, the Einsoft, emanates into reality, and that is what we perceive to be God. And there's plenty of people who have no problem believing. That's what people say about Yeshua all the time. They're like, well, Yeshua's God. Well, then the people say, well, is he, is he and God the, the same substance? Which is, I'm quoting from the debate at the Council of Nicaea here. Is he the same, is he homo with God? Is he hetero with God? You know, these Greek concepts that really have nothing to do with, you know, the religion of Israel. Um, but it, it, these, the philosophical concepts were working their way into the Greek, the Greek mindset was working its way into the, the Jewish world. And it was bringing out questions that the Jewish mystics and uh, uh, rabbis were either going to have to answer or they were going to have to try to sweep under the rug and hope nobody asked. Because the, when someone asks you a philosophical question about what you believe in your religion, you have either got to hit it head on and answer it or you're going to have to run away from it and hope they aren't able to find you. And uh, these days, that's not possible because, trust me, they'll find you. You uh, the, Now is the time when everyone can find everything they want to know, you know, instantaneously and hunt down pretty much anybody you want to find. So basically, the, uh, the, the, the religious scholars at the time were trying to come to grips with these questions that Greek philosophy was bringing in. And part of it was the, the, the construction of the idea of Yehovah as Einsoff, and we just saw these emanations of him. It has, it's metaphysics is what it is. Metaphysics means beside physics. Let me, when, I, when someone ever somebody says metaphysics, let me tell you what metaphysics is. Metaphysics is the name of the book that um, Aristotle filed next to the book called Physics. That's why it's called metaphysics. It means next to physics. So if you want to know all the weird stuff, it's in the book next to the physics book. That's where, that's where you'll find it. That's what metaphysics means. All right, so uh, let's see. And the emanation of God, the crown was really Einsoft, and it, he was the spring, the source from which the infinite light issued. You've got to understand light. We think of light today in a physical sense. Uh, it's a photon. It's a, a discrete packet of energy. It's a electromagnetic radiation. We, can, we know how fast it goes. We can shoot it in lasers. We we can use it in all kind of interesting ways. I got a light right here that, uh, you know, I just flip the switch, turn right on. Uh, in those days, light was considered a, a divine and holy substance because you could see it, but it didn't have any weight. That's why something that is light doesn't weigh much because it's like light, which doesn't weigh anything, and yet you see it. Um, it, it, it was considered a, a, this holy thing. Um, that's why you might even say that the... Uh, the pyramids themselves might just be big prisms to help you understand how if light comes into it a certain way, it shoots out of it in a different way. You know, because when light goes into a prism, it hits in an angle and comes out. White light makes a rainbow when it comes out the other side. Um, let's see. Light issued for. If Philo found greater difficulties, he had also more ready help from the philosophical systems to hand. His Sephiroth were potencies, words, intermediate powers. Potencies, as we imagine, when viewed God words. Words, as viewed creation words. They were not emanations, but according to Philo, archetypal ideas on the model of which all that existed was formed, and also according to the Stoic idea, the cause of all, pervading all, performing all, and sustaining all. Thus these potencies were wholly in God, yet wholly out of God. If we divest all this of its philosophical coloring, did not Eastern Judaism also teach that there was a distinction between the unapproachable God and the God manifest? Okay, so this is a complex something to chew on. Um, and lucky for me, I, I actually have a degree in philosophy, so a lot of that made sense to me when he was talking about it. But uh, what he's doing is he's, he's showing that there was lots of different philosophical traditions that were being tossed around in Greece. 
the two that fell most interestingly in the, near the Jewish world was the Stoicism and the Platonic. Okay, the Platonic tradition divided the world into three worlds. That's the world of the perfect world, which is the world of the, the forms, which is the place where these things that actually are perfect exist. And they're like the, I don't, how would you think of it? Like the storehouse of true and real things. Um, we live in the reality that we live in, uh, which we, we actually, there's nothing here that's perfect. And in fact, I mean, you could prove that physically. There's literally nothing in this world that's perfect. Nothing, for instance, a perfect circle is 360 degrees, right? Draw one. You can't because if, as, as, you micro, as, you, as you microscope down the size of the paper that you've drawn it on, and you, you re eventually you hit the point where there's graphite from your pencil spread out all over the place and it doesn't look like a circle anymore because there's no perfect edge to it. There's just nothing perfect here because our world is divided into these tiny little um, pixels, I guess would be the best way to say it. it, it's, it we have a pixelated reality based on the idea of the Planck time and the Planck constant of length. Um, it, down to the to the microscopic and then the submicroscopic, which is the subatomic scale, where literally things just start to get crazy. It's not nothing there at that level, at least as we understand it currently, is comparable to what is up here at this level where we are. So, and that's not what Plato. Let me get back to Plato. There's the real world of the forms, which is the perfect world, which people end up basically calling heaven now, even though that's not really what Plato was getting at, but people have taken that Platonic idea and said, oh, one day I'm going to go to heaven where, I can, where I'll be perfect and everything's perfect and the perfection exists and God is perfect, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the real world that we live in, and Plato's attached that to us. And then he said there's also the world of the imagination, which is where we can perceive anything we want. We can create the ability for anything we want to exist in our own mind and our imaginations. Okay, so... Those are the, the two different philosophical traditions that uh, were most appealing to the Jews, the intellectual Jews at the time. And because they were probably the largest ones in the Greek world at the time too, because Plato, of course, very famous. Uh, Plato was a, taught, uh, was a student of Socrates. Plato taught Aristotle. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. And of course, so the Greek tradition is very, very based on the teachings of Plato and Aristotle. And if you go to college today, you'll hear plenty of uh, Platonic thought. If you go to church, you'll hear plenty of Platonic thought. You just didn't know it was Platonic thought you were listening to. So um, let's see here. And, and then he talks about in the, Eastern in the Eastern Judaism, that's the ones that are east of Jerusalem, more towards the Middle East or the Persian world. Um, he says that there, even there, they have a distinction between the divine being of God, and which is the unapproachable one, like when God says, to Moses, no one can look on my face and live, so I can't show you my face. I have to put you in the cleft of the rock. And yet then we send the high priest into the Holy of Holies, you know, once a year at Yom Kippur to come face to face with him, right? And heck, you see several times mentioned that God comes down and talks to, to Miriam and Moses in front of him. He talks to Miriam and Aaron in front of everybody. He chastises Miriam and Aaron in, Aaron in front of the people that were there gathered. They saw it happen. And Miriam was afflicted with uh, leprosy for something that she did. You know, how can this guy who says, you can't see my face live and then show up and then they can see his face? So he's saying, you know, they had to come, they had to reckon these things and uh, explain how, how these things that seem contradictory could exist. And that's part of what Philo's doing is he's trying to create. And I wish he'd have just... <sighs> In philosophy, there's a thing called epistemology, right? That is a theory of knowledge. So what we're talking about is Philo's epistemology regarding how his religion is still the right one but can fit together with all these Greek ideas too. All right, so another remark of the parallelism, another remark will show the parallelism between Philo and Rabbinism. When I say Rabbinism, I mean the teaching of rabbis. That's what Rabbinism is. As the latter speaks of the two qualities, that is the midoth or mercy and judgment, and the divine being, as per uh, Jeremiah Bear 9, 7, because he's quoting the Talmud here, and distinguishes between Elohim as the God of justice and Yehovah as the God of mercy and grace. 
So Philo places next to the divine word goodness, um, as is the creative potency, and the power as the ruling potency, proving this by a curious etymological derivation of the words for God and Lord. And this is and he's doing this all in Greek. I mean, he's not even doing this from the Hebrew. Apparently unconscious that the Septuagint, in the direct contradiction, translated Yehovah by Lord or Kyrios. I read that in Greek. It says Kyrios. And Elohim by God. Um, these two potencies of goodness and power Philo sees in the two cherubim and in the two angels which accompanied God, the divine word, when on his way to destroy the cities of the plain. That's what I just talked about was when he saw when he saw him walk past Abraham's tent, um, according to the number of the cities of refuge. I'm oh, sorry, uh, in the cities of plain, but there were more than two potencies. In one place, Philo enumerates six, according to the number of the cities of refuge. The potencies issued from God as the beams from the light, as the waters from the spring, as the breath from a person. These were eminent in God, and yet also without him, motions on the part of God, and yet independent beings. They were the ideal world, which in its impulse outward, meeting matter, produced this material world of ours. There were also the angels of God, these messengers to man, the media, through whom he revealed himself. Okay, so that is Philo's uh, explanation of intermer int intermediary beings, which means things that come between you and God. So he's saying, oh, there's, there's angels and um, even what you think of as Yehovah and Elohim are actually just these potencies of what the Ein Soft is. There's this, the, 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 there's this, the arm of him that is on the, the left side of the ark and the right side of the ark, and the, these two angels that are walking there past Abraham's house are really what he really is, and that he's you know, described as being there with the angels because he is the essence of what the two angels... He, he obviously... He's digging here, so re referring to Philo, he's he's trying to make quasi philosophical sense of the religion he was raised in, to try to um, to make it compatible with the Greek mindset, and to, and also probably to to show the Greeks, because he was probably dealing with a lot of Greek philosophers there in Alexandria, how it was totally cool for him to be a Jew and to think things that Jews think, and to still study Greek philosophy because. It can all work together if you just work it the right way, right? All right, and this is his third concept. That is of the logos, right? And this is something that is written in the New Testament. You will see logos, which is word, over and over again. And lots of times people say, oh, God is the logos. And the Holy Spirit is the Sophia, which is the wisdom, right? And the, the God is the male aspect. He's the logos. And Sophia is the female aspect. The, the Holy Spirit but again, all these are Greek concepts. This isn't this isn't Hebrew stuff. This isn't Israelite thinking. This is Greek thinking. So here we go. The Logos. Viewed in its bearing on the New Testament teaching, this part of Philo's system raises the most interesting questions. But it is just here that our difficulties are greatest. We can understand that Platonic conception of the Logos as the archetypal idea and that of the Stoics as of the world reason pervading matter. Okay, so he's saying that in the two different philosophical traditions, you can think of the Logos as the archetypal idea. So God is the source from which all things come. So he is the Logos. He's, he's the, he created the world by his word. So the world is just words that, are come, that have come out of his mouth. So he is the creator of all things. So he's the archetype, which is the, um, the overarching, you know, when I say arc, like an arc holds up everything else, the arch holds up everything else. He's, um, he's the idea that holds up everything else, right? And I think, um, which, I can't remember which old church philosopher it was, he had the idea of the, um, everything dependent on God. Like if there was no God, then the universe itself would simply fall apart because there was nothing for it, the universe to be, to cling to, to actually be able to exist. And uh, what the Stoics call is the world reason pervading matter. So from him, the matter of the world was created. Right? Similarly, we can perceive how the Apocrypha, especially the Book of Wisdom, following up the Testament, typical 
the Old Testament typical truth concerning, quote, wisdom, as specially set forth in the book of the Proverbs, almost arrive so far as to present, quote, wisdom as a, quote, subsistence, hypostatizing it. More than this, in Talmudic writings, we find mention not only of the Shem, that is the name, Shem is name in Hebrew, by the way, and that means authority, it doesn't just mean whatever moniker is stuck on you, um, but also of the Shekinah of God as manifest and present, which is sometimes also presented, presented as the Ruach HaKodesh. 1880s in their books, got right there, Ruach HaKodesh. Uh, or Holy Spirit, right? But in the Targum, we meet yet another expression, which, strange to say, never occurs in the Talmud. And remember, the Targum are the um, Aramaic, uh, trend, like when they would read the Torah out loud, um, there would be a targamam, a targaman who would who would translate it into Aramaic for the people that were there that couldn't speak Hebrew but could speak Aramaic, and they would also give a meaning of what it meant in the Aramaic tongue. Um, people that wrote down the discussions about the Torah that were expressed in the Aramaic, they wrote down these books, and they were called targum. Uh, it was forbidden for people to have these books, by the way, because it meant that you were writing down the the oral tradition. Uh, where people could read it, and you weren't allowed to do that. You had to go to the synagogue and hear it there first. You know, you, you can't be writing it around and writing it down and passing it around. You know, Lord knows some of these goyim might hear what we what we've been studying. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, in that of the Memra, logos or word, not that the term is exclusively applied to the divine logos, but it stands out as perhaps the most remarkable fit in this literature that God, not as in His permanent manifestation or manifest presence, but as revealing himself is designated as Memra. Uh, altogether, that term as applied to God occurs in the Targum on Kalos 179 times, in this so-called Jerusalem Targum 99 times, and in the Targum Pseudo-Jonathan 321 times. A critical analysis shows that in 82 instances in on Kalos, in 71 instances in the Jerusalem Targum, Targum, and in 213 instances in the Targum Suda Jonathan, the designation Memra is not only distinguished from God, but it evidently refers to God as revealing himself. But what does this imply? The distinction between God and the Memra of Yehovah is marked in many passages. Similarly, the Memra of Yehovah is distinguished from the Shekinah, nor is the term used instead of the sacred word um, Yehovah nor for the well-known Old Testament expression, quote, the angel of the Lord, unquote, nor yet for the Metatron or the Targum Suda Jonathan or and of the Talmud. Does it then represent an older tradition underlying all of these? So he's just asking the question is, is the reason that they're mentioning things that aren't mentioned in the Talmud and these older writings, much older than the Talmud, uh, these Targum that were coming out from around that first a uh, little before the the pre first century time when the like uh after the Babylonian captivity, not everybody by any means I think it was fifty thousand people returned to uh Jerusalem of the million that had been taken, and then they be they rebuilt the walls, they rebuilt the temple, they kind of started up the traditions again, trying to get things going then they had the problem with Persia, which is the remembrance of Purim is to remember what happened in the book of Esther. And then after that cooled down, cooled off, then comes Antiochus Epiphanes, and then he's messing around with stuff, and then there's the Maccabean Revolt. And during all this time, a lot of things are happening in Israel, and, and people are, things are breaking apart, and things are coming back together. And uh, during this time, the uh, synagogue is created around the time of the Babylonian captivity. So after that time, you, you start to see the emergence of these Targum, which is the, the people recording what is being discussed in the synagogue or or what the the ha, ha, or the Haggadah and some of the Halakha but the Haggadah of these different rabbis as they're talking about what they what they want people to understand these things to mean all right so anyways um so he's speculating that there may even have been a a different understanding of what God was prior to the Talmud which has now been lost because it's just not a part of the the current understanding does it then represent an older tradition underlying all these Beyond this rabbinic theology has not uh, beyond this rabbinic theology has not preserved to us the doctrine 
of the personal distinctions in the Godhead. And yet, if words have any meaning, the memra is hypostasis, though the distinction of permanent, personal subsistence is not marked, nor yet to complete this subject is the memra identified with the Messiah. In the Targum Onkelos, distinct mention is twice made of him. Genesis 49.10 and 11 and Numbers 24.17, while in the other Targum, no fewer than 71 biblical passages are rendered in explicit reference to him. So, and you'll see this with modern rabbis too. The point he's trying to make is the mention and the tying together of Messiah to different um, biblical passages is old. It's not something necessarily that's new. It's definitely, well, at least, at least from after the Babylonian captivity, you start to see the, uh, the idea of the coming Messiah. And, and we've been reading this in these last few chapters is, you know, probably from, I don't know, 200 years prior to coming up in, the apocryphal writings start getting real heavy on Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming. He's going to save us. He's going to save us. He's going to, Superman's going to come and, you know, rescue us from our oppressors, you know, overthrow the Greeks, going to overthrow the Romans, going to bring us up and make us the people we're supposed to be. We're, we're going to rule and reign, you know, we're going to put this world right, and uh, he's going to sit on the throne, and the, these ideas, which are still being said by people today. Um, it, the point that uh, Edersheim's making is that this is not something that's new, and there's really no need for, because um, I'm sure he was arguing with rabbis at the time, you know, trying to sell them on Yeshua, and they were probably saying to him, no, that's not something that we, we do. And he, I'm sure he was like, oh, yes, you do. You've been doing it since the Babylonian captivity, talking about Messiah coming and relating him to all these different scriptures. If we now turn to the views expressed by Philo about the Logos, we find that they are hesitating, even contradictory. One thing, however, is plain. The Logos of Philo is not the Memra of the Targum, but the expression Memra ultimately rests on the theological that of Logos on philosophical grounds. Again, the Logos of Philo approximates more closely to the Metatron of the Talmud and the Kabbalah, as they speak of him as, quote, the prince of the face, unquote, who bore the name of his Lord. So Philo represents the Logos as, quote, the eldest angel, unquote, the many-named archangel, unquote. In accordance with the Jewish view, that the name Yehovah unfolded its meaning in 70 names of the Godhead. So, and that's, I don't know if you know that, but the, uh, okay. If you look in different ancient codexes that have been found, you'll typically see the name Yehovah written with no vowel points. Okay, and that, some modern Jews say that's because it's actually an acronym for the 70 names of God, or the 70-letter name of God, okay? Now, recently, Nehemia Gordon has been doing this research with several other people who are Christian people. They have been going and combing through ancient codexes looking for the actual vowel points being written in the name to see if it really is his name or not. And it is, and they have found it in probably a thousand different times in, in a hundred different manuscripts, and you can go on YouTube and watch a whole video. I, Posted it on my channel. It's probably up there. If you if you happen to look, you'll see it on there. And it has been found with the vowel points, and it does say Yehovah. That is what his name is written as by the scribes, you know, probably a thousand different times over a hundred different manuscripts. So yeah, apparently those scribes thought that that's how you say his name, and apparently they slipped up and wrote it while they were in the middle of, you know, you don't find it written in the Torah. You find it written in, like, Prophet Jeremiah, or you find it written in the Prophet Isaiah. You find it written in Ezekiel. You find it written... In these um, prophetic writings, you'll actually see Yehovah written in a couple places. But usually they write it with no vowel points because it's, it's considered, like every time I'm saying it, you know, I'm violating a, the tradition. You're not supposed to say the name of God out loud. And even a modern day Jew will tell you, um, it's, not that we, it's, not that, it's not that we're not allowed to say it. It's just there's so much power in his name. If you say it, it's like unleashing a whirlwind every time you do it on the world. So it's just better not to do it, you know, and to, to hold him in reverence like that, which is fine. I guess I've unleashed a lot of whirlwinds, you know, while I've been reading this today. Um, so, and again, the name Yehovah unfolded its meaning in 70 names of the Godhead. 
as they speak of the Adam Kadmon, so Philo of the, of the Logos, as the human reflection of the eternal God, in both these respects is worthy of notice that he appeals to ancient teachings. So Adam Kadmon is the idea of Adam, you know, the first man, being the perfect um, entity, the perfect human, because he's made in God's image and God literally handcrafted him. It's not like he wasn't born of a woman, you know, he wasn't born of a rib either. You know, he was born by God's hand, handcrafted from the dirt, and that would make him the perfect human, right? That's why God brought him the animals and said, here, give them names. You give them authority. Give these animals some authority and tell them what they need to be doing, you know? That's, that was a gift given or a privilege given to Adam that he would get to do that. All right, what then is this logos of Philo? Not a concrete personality, and yet from another point of view, not strictly impersonal, nor merely a property of the deity, but the shadow, as it were, which the light of God casts, and if himself light, only the, manifestation, only the manifested reflection of God, his spiritual, even as the world is his material habitation. Moreover, the Logos is, quote, the image of God, unquote, upon which man was made, or to use the Platonic term, the archetypal idea, as regards the relation between the Logos and the two fundamental potencies from which all others issue. The latter are variously represented on the one hand as proceeding from the Logos, on the other as themselves constituting the Logos. Uh, as regards the world, the Logos is its real being. He is also its archetype. Moreover, the instrument through whom God created all things. If the Logos separates God and the world, it is rather as intermediary he separates, but he also unites. But chiefly does this hold true as regards the relation between God and man. The Logos announces and interprets to man the will and the mind of God. He acts as a mediator. He is the real high priest, and as such, by his purity, takes away the sins of man, and by his intercession procures for us the mercy of God. Hence Philo designates him not only as the high priest, but as the paraclete. And this is a term you may have heard used in the church. <laughs> paraclete. Um, he is also the son whose rays enlighten man, the medium of the divine revelation to the soul, the manna, or support of spiritual life. He dwells in the soul, and so the Logos is, in the fullest sense, Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, the King of Righteousness, the King of Salem, who brings righteousness and peace to the soul. And then he quotes uh, from the Talmud there, but the Logos does not come into any soul that is dead in sin, that there is so close similarity of form between these Alexandrian views and much of the argumentation of the Epistle of Hebrews must be evident to all, no less that there be the widest possible divergence in the substance, ugh, divergence in substance and spirit. The Logos of Philo is shadowy, unreal, not a person. There is no need of an atonement. The high priest intercedes, but has no sacrifice to offer as the basis of his intercession, least of all that of himself. The Old Testament types are only type, typical ideas, not typical facts, they point to a prototypal idea in the eternal past, not to an anti, not to an antitypal person and fact in history. There is no cleansing of the soul by, by blood, no sprinkling of the mercy seat, no access for all through the rent veil into the immediate presence of God, nor yet a quickening of the soul from dead works to serve the living God. If the argumentation of the epistle to the Hebrews is Alexandrian, it is an Alexandrian which is overcome and past, which only furnishes the form, not the substance, the vessels, not the contents. The closer, therefore, the outward similarity, the greater is the contrast and substance. Wow, that is a big paragraph. Okay, so... This is what <laughs> this is what you get taught in a modern church from what the book they say this is what the book of Hebrews means right with the uh, the change of the priesthood and the law has changed etc cetera, etc cetera. these are all greek philosophical concepts that have worked into the 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 traditions of Israel and he has literally showed you that Philo of Alexandria is probably where they came from. 
because Philo of Alexandria was trying to come up with a comprehensive way of explaining why it was okay for him to be a Jew and to believe things that Jews believe and at the same time be in agreement with the uh, philosophy of the Stoics and the philosophies of Plato because the philosophies of the Stoics and Plato were built upon the, the rational ideas, right? And if he was to say rational ideas are nonsense, then that would certainly make him unavailable for a, uh, to be considered a man of intellect, right? And it was important for a, I mean, this was a golden age in a sense. This is when the, the trade around the Mediterranean Sea was going on. This, this is a time when people who were, well, well let's be honest, they, the Jews tend to be a very intelligent people. I have no problem admitting that. In fact, there's, Jews will tell you they have more dendrite connections in their brains than uh, any other race. And I've seen the doctor that said it. You know, these are out there on YouTube. You can look it up. Jews and dendrite connections in the brain. For them to look dead on at somebody who from a philosophical basis has explained in a rational way why they believe what they believe, and then they come at him with, well, God told me to do it, they're going to feel like idiots. So they're going to have to come to, a, to, to understand how not only had God told me to do it, but God told me to do it because it is philosophically correct. And now I'm going to explain to you how it's philosophically correct, even if I have to bend and twist and turn and flip it inside out to get it there. I'm going to make sure when I'm done, and I'm speaking this Philo here, I'm going to make sure when I'm done that it's valid and consistent, even though it may seem crazy to some of my other brothers out there who have a more... Um, well, God told me to do it. That's why I do it. You know, way of looking at why they take, why they do what they do for God. Um, and what he's pointed out to us is basically so much of what, the way Philo's um, religious understanding is is taught in the Book of Hebrews. I mean, there's even people who say that. I'm sure some people say Paul wrote the Book of Hebrews. Some people say I don't know who wrote the Book of Hebrews because it's really not Paul's manner of writing. I mean, even though Paul's manner of writing is typically very confusing, if you're not a you know, uh, a rabbi from the first century, it would be very confusing to read what Paul was writing because lots of times he's talking about the, uh, he's talking about the Targum, he's talking about the Mishnah, he's talking about the Oral Torah, and he's talking about the Written Torah, and he's trying to explain it all to people who don't know anything about either of them, and it can come out as being a lot of um, gobbledygook because um, modern Christian people they read the writings of Paul and they read it in English and they, they, they think, they say, well, I got the Spirit of God, so I understand what being a good person is, so I'm going to just go with whatever my impression of what he's saying is because it seems straightforward. But when you learn the history of Israel, when you take time to study the Torah, when you, when you understand the philosophical concepts of the people, of the rabbis, of the Greek world at the time, you can see that there's a lot to actually take apart in there to understand what is it exactly that Paul is trying to explain to you. In fact, Peter said very specifically, he said, you know, we love, we love our brother Paul. We love Paul. You know, we're glad for what he's doing. But he's very hard to understand. So be careful not to take what he has taught you and twist it to the, the ideas of lawless men. You know, don't, don't, don't take what he says and turn it into a license to go and do what lawless men do. Because that's not what he's teaching you. He's, I mean, he's a rabbi. He's not going to teach that. He's going to teach you, if anything, he might, he's going to go a little too far teaching oral Torah. He's probably going to go a little too far in teaching you some of his own Haggadah or some of his own ideas about the right way to do things. And you even hear it described. He describes himself. He says, you know, you, you give milk to a baby. That's the Torah. You give the baby the, the, the stuff that's easy to digest. And then when, they, when, they're, when they've grown up and they've, and they've understood the milk, then feed them the meat. When I say the meat, I'm got, and I'm saying it, I'm not talking about meat like beef. I'm talking, I'm not talk, I'm, I'm talking about meat like uh, the meat of um, the vegetables and the, uh, the grains, the, the meaty bread that they would have served to people at the time. So he's like, babies eat milk, right? Well, humans eat, you know, when I say humans, adults can eat that big grainy bread that they ate back then and chew on it, chew on it, chew on it. Because, and and that's, a, that's a Jewish concept all up to today. The, the idea of you want to be a kosher animal, and, and we, we read this two chapters ago. What's this kosher? Why, why are these kosher animals described? Because we have to learn to live certain ways like these kosher animals. And in this case, the cow chews the cud, right? Has a split hoof. You know, hey, 
here's the Aaronic priestly blessing, right? You got it? There's your split hoof. I have, I'm going to do the Aaronic blessing over you. I've got a split hoof. And I chew the word. I chew that, the cut of that word. And I chew it and chew it and chew it until I can finally swallow it down. Because I'm, he, he's teaching him to be this kosher animal. And he's probably definitely not going to teach him to eat milk and meat together because he probably didn't teach him to do that because he, he probably carried on that rabbinical tradition that you don't eat milk and meat together. Anywho, let's get back into what um, Philo is saying here. In the vast difference between the Alexandrian, the vast difference between Alexandrianism and the New Testament will appear still more clearly in the views of Philo on cosmology and anthropology. Okay, cosmology is the universe. The co cosmological thinking is thinking about the entire universe. The cosmos is all of creation. It's not just the earth. You say... Um, John 3.16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All right, that's not so God so loved the world. It's God so loved the cosmos. That's all of creation. He loved all of creation so much that he gave his only begotten son. You know, that, that was the point. He was, he was saving all of creation, not just the earth. All right, so let's see. The epistles, all right, so the difference here. And anthropology, anthropology is the study of humans. Anthro, again, humans. Andro is humans. Anthropology is the study of humans. So, um, in regards to Philo's understanding on cosmology and anthropology, in regard to the former, again, this anthropology, his results in some respects run parallel to those of the students of the mysticism in the Talmud and of the Kabbalists, together with the Stoic view, which represented God as, quote, the active cause, unquote, of this world, the matter as, quote, the passive, Unquote. Philo holds the Platonic idea that matter was something existent and that it resisted God. Such speculations must have been current among the Jews long before to judge by certain warnings givings by the, given by the son of Syriac. The Stoic views of the origin of the world seem implied even in the Book of Wisdom and the Wisdom of Solomon. The mystics in the Talmud arrived at a similar conclusion, though not Greek, but through Persian teachings. Their speculations boldly entered in on the dangerous ground, quote, forbidden to the many, scarcely allowed to the few, were such deep questions as the origin of our world and its connection with God were discussed. It was perhaps only a beautiful poetic figure that God had taken of the dust under the throne of his glory and cast it upon the waters, which thus became earth. And he quotes from Shem R. 19, because again, he's quoting different Talmudic writings. But so far did isolate teacher, isolated teachers become intoxicated by the new wine of these strange speculations that they whispered it to one another that water was the original element of the world which had successfully been hardened into snow and then into earth. Other and later teachers fixed upon the air uh, or the fire as the original element, arguing the pre-existence of matter from the use of the word, quote, made, unquote, in Genesis 1-7, instead of created. So he's saying basically the word there says that God made it, now that he created it, so he had to have a forge or something that he made it in, right? Some modified this view and suggested that God had originally created the three elements of water, air, and spirit, or air, or spirit, and fire, from which all else was developed, traces also occur of the doctrine of the pre-existence of things in the sense similar to that of Plato. Okay, so all this was going on in the first century. There were all these different philosophical traditions and all these debates that different people were having about what is God, how, how did the world get made, what does it mean when it says God made the world, not that he created the world, and of course you go, what is, why does it say toho boho, at the beginning, when I say God remade the world, is it that really there was already a world and then he, he made a new one or that he had taken the world and destroyed it and made another one? There's a lot of arguing um, for argument's sake, I guess, we should, I guess I would say. Like Plato and the Stoics, Philo regarded matter as devoid of all quality and even form. Matter in itself was dead. More than that, it was evil. <laughs> This matter, which was already existing, God formed, not made, like an architect who uses his materials according to, what, to a pre-existing plan, which in this case was the archetypal world. 
This was creation, or rather formation, brought about not by God himself, but by the potencies, especially by the Logos, who was the connecting bond of all. As for God, his only direct work was that of making the soul. So he's saying the only thing that God actually made was the soul, and everything else he molded, because, hey, that's the Egyptian, um, uh, the potter. The uh, Egyptians had seven gods called the potters, who supposedly made the world, or maybe were five gods, I think it was seven, who supposedly made you know the world and, and the creation, that they had crafted them with their hands, right? Because they were the potters. Only, of course, you... Hey, isn't that something that you say? You know, I'm the I'm the clay. You are the potter. You know, mold me and make me. Only direct work was the soul, and the only of and the only of the good, not of the evil. So the only thing that, that Philo said God ever really made was the soul, and because it was good and it's not evil. Man's immaterial part had a twofold aspect: earthward, earthwards as sensuousness, and heavenwards as his reason. The sensuous part of the soul was connected to the body. It had no heavenly past and would have no future. That's to say your lust, the, the lust of the flesh, right? But reason was the breath of true life which God had breathed into man, whereby the, earthly, the earthy became the higher living spirit with its various faculties. Before time began, the soul was without a body, an archetype, the heavenly man, the pure spirit in paradise, uh, yeah, pure, pure virtue, yet even so longing after its ultimate archetype, God himself. Some of these pure spirits descended into bodies and so lost their purity, or else the union was brought about by God and by powers lower than God, that is to say, the demons, or Dianemon. To the latter is due our earthly part. God breathed on the formation, and earthly reason became intellect, spiritual soul. Our earthly part alone is the seat of sin. So here you see... Um, Philo's theology is the idea of this, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, the sin you can't escape, the one you're born into, like you're born into the world that is sin, and so you're born with this sin debt that can never be paid. And, uh, you know, they, they, they try to trace it back to Adam and Eve in the garden, but actually Philo's saying it actually pre predates that, and it's it's because the whole world is actually evil and God just formed you from it and gave you a soul which is not evil, which has the ability to reason, which is why you're not an animal, which allows you to transcend the lust of your flesh and um, which, I mean, you may recall the what are the three wishes of man, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know, there's, a, there's, a Greek, there's a Greek concepts that are being used to express a, um, a, a, a Jewish understanding of what sin is. All right, let's see here. This leads us to the great question. Uh, oh, original sin. It was the next sentence. Original sin. Here the views of Philo are those of the Eastern rabbis, but both are entirely different from those on which the argument of the epistle to the Romans turns. It was neither at the feet of Gamaliel nor yet from the Jewish Hellenism that Saul of Tarsus learned the doctrine of original sin. The statement that as in Adam all are spiritually dead, die, all spiritually died, so in Messiah should all be yet alive, finds absolutely no parallel in Jewish writings. What may be called the starting point of Christian theology, the doctrine of hereditary guilt and sin through the fall of Adam, and of the consequent entire and helpless corruption of our nature, is entirely unknown to, the rabbinic, to rabbinical Judaism. The reign of physical death was indeed traced to the sin of our first parents. But the Talmud expressly teaches in Bear 6a that God originally created man with two propensities, one to be good and one to be evil. That is the yet yeset tob and the yet set yetzer harar. The evil impulse began immediately after birth. But it was within the power of man to vanquish sin and to attain perfect righteousness. In fact, this stage had actually been attained. So, in the Jewish thought, it's like people are born with the capacity to do evil and the capacity to do good. You're born where you, all you want to do is evil because, of course, all you're thinking about is yourself. When you're born, you're going to do whatever it takes to eat. You're going to do whatever it takes to get what you want. When you're a little baby, I mean, all you know how to do is ask for what you need. That's what babies do. And then you take it to the next step where you start to grow up, and, and that's when you can start taking care of someone else. You can start giving 
to other people. And then, and of course, that's the idea what it, what the conservative Jews would say, you need to give charity, et cetera, et cetera, so you can, you know, uh, basically get spiritual points. Since there's no temple to make sacrifices at, you know, and Paul takes it on the bulls of your lips, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the idea that <clears throat> you have the up and the down with Judaism. Christianity, you only got the down, right? You, you, you can't do anything good because none seeks after God. No, not one. So you have to get Christ in your life to actually give you any potential to go up. Jews are like, no, you can do what's good. The Torah tells you how to do what's good. If you do what the Torah says, you're doing things that are, you, you're not sinning because you're not, you're not doing sin. The Torah told you what sin was, which is confirmed in Christianity. It says, what is sin? New Testament will tell you. Sin is transgression of the law. That's exactly what it is. So what he's getting at is the, uh, the idea of the, the type of original sin that's in the modern church is not uh, exactly the same type that Philo of Alexandria had in his theology, which would be the idea that the, world, the, the, the material world itself is evil inherently. It has no, it has no choice. It's dead and it, it must be evil because it is a world of death. Everything is dead in the material world. The only thing that really is alive is the soul, right? So you have to embrace soul, which is rationality, to become alive in this world of death, you know, in that sense. And then in the church, it goes into Christianity and grows, or it, maybe it grows in through Paul's idea that all, everyone is dead through Adam because of the mistake that Adam made, which, which caused him to die. Well, I mean, if he'd ate from the tree of life, he wouldn't have died. God wouldn't let him eat from the tree of life. Yeah. Tough, tough, tough fights to have. All right, let's see here. Um, similarly, Philo regarded the soul of the child as naked. Adam and Eve, I guess he would say tabula rasa, right? Naked, uh, a sort of, oh, of tabula rasa, literally what he said, as wax which God would fain form and mold. But this state ceased when affection presented itself to reason and thus sensuousness sensuous lust arose which was the spring of all sin the grand task then was to get rid of the sensuousness and to rise to the spiritual in this the ethical part of the system philo was the most under the influence of the stoic of stoic philosophy we might say also it is no longer the hebrew but the hellenism but the helene who hebrew i who hebrewizes so he's saying in this sense that um He's pushing so hard for Stoic thought, um, the separation from the, the lust of the flesh uh, into the, to the rational that, I mean, and frankly, he's leaving behind a lot. Of, what's the first commandment? Be fruitful and multiply. What do you got to do to do that? You got to have sex. What you got to do to make babies? So right off the bat, I said, go make babies. I mean, that's part of what he tells me. How else are you going to have people? Obviously, Jehovah wants to have people because he tells them be fruitful and multiply. But Philo's pushing this um, stoic Hellenism. It is scarcely possible to convey an idea of how brilliant this method becomes in the hands of Philo, how universal its application, or how captivating it must have proved. Philo describes man's state as, first one of sensuousness, but also of unrest, misery, and unsatisfied longing. If persisted in, it would end in complete spiritual insensibility, but from this state, the soul must pass to one of devotion to reason. This change might be accomplished in one of three ways. First, by study, or which physical was the lowest. Next, that which embraced the ordinary circle of knowledge. And lastly, the highest, that of divine philosophy. The second method was askesis, discipline or practice, when the soul turned from the lower to the higher. But the best of all this was the third, the free unfolding of that spiritual life, which comes neither from study nor discipline, but from natural good disposition. And in that state, the soul had true rest and joy. So it sounds to me like it's a lot. You know, here's, here's one of the things you hear people say in the church. You know, you, you got to have the Holy Spirit. You've got the Holy Spirit. And you're going to do what's right. You don't need to know what the law is because the law is written on your heart. Because you've got the Holy Spirit. You're going to do what's right. Well, I Maybe. I mean, that sounds like exactly what Philo was reasoning, is that if you had the highest level of uh, of spiritual attainment, you know, whatever this open door of the soul is, um, then you would automatically do what's right. But 
his type of doing what's right is the resistance of doing what your flesh wants. So it is the uh, the, the acceptance of of servitude because servitude is the, to serve others is the opposite of serving yourself. You know, of course, then some would say, well, if there's really no altruism, then uh, really you are just. If there's no altruism, then everything you do, which you perceived as being good, was actually to serve yourself. Even though you thought you were serving somebody else, really it's because you, you, you're aiming to get something back from them one day or something along those lines. It, the, philosophy, I love it. Here we must, <clears throat> for the present, pause. Brief as this sketch of Hellenism has been, it must have brought the question vividly before the mind, whether or how far certain parts of the New Testament, especially the fourth gospel, are connected with the direction of thought described in the preceding pages, without yielding to that school of critics whose perverse ingenuity discerns everywhere a sinister motive or tendency in the evangelical writers. It is evident that each of these had a special object in view in constructing his narrative of the one life and primarily addressed himself to a special audience. If, without entering into elaborate discussion, we might, according to Luke 1-2, regard the narrative of St. Mark as the great representation of the authentic narration, though not by the apostles, which was in circulation, and the gospel by St. Matthew as representing the tradition handed down by the apostle apostolic eyewitnesses and the ministers of the word we should reach the following results our oldest gospel narratives narrative is that by saint mark which addressing itself is no class in particular sketches in rapid outlines the pictures of yeshua as the messiah alike for all men next in our order of time comes our present gospel of saint matthew it goes a step farther back than that of St. Mark, and gives not only the genealogy, but the history of the miraculous birth of Yeshua. Even we had not the consensus, even if we had not the consensus of tradition, everyone must feel that the gospel in the Hebrew is Hebrew in its cast, in its citations from the Old Testament, and in its whole bearing. So what he's saying is the uh, the gospel of Mark's the, the oldest writing, um, of the four synoptic gospels. Synoptic means the four um, views. So we have the four synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are all different um, views on the life of Christ. Uh, most people say the Gospel of John is written about 120 A.D. I mean, that's almost 100 years after Christ. Um, frankly, um, when I get a book that's 100 years after a historical event, I'm pretty sure it ain't going to be a very good, accurate assessment of what happened. Or it may be the most accurate assessment to happen because it may have the longest amount of time to collect the most information. Um, he's saying basically the Gospel of Mark was first. Uh, if you read in your King James Bible, it says in the introduction of the Gospel of Mark, it was probably written for Roman people to read <clears throat> because it would have been a, a writing that would have, you know, it's just the facts. Just tell, tell, just tell me what's going on. You know, that, I don't care who his great-grandfather was. I don't care if he's, you know, the son of David or Abraham or whoever, just tell me who this guy is. Who Who is this Christ? Who is this Yeshua? Why, why should I care who he is? And that's the kind of person that Mark's written for. While the Gospel of Matthew is written with genealogies and, you know, make sure to know everything went according to the law, you know, he's circumcised on the eighth day, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know that the things that are written about there are the kind of things that are important to a, a Hebrew-minded you know, Israelite Jewish person who's reading this text. You know that that's the person who it's written to. Um, and Luke, of course, is written um, to the Greek mindset, uh, which is a lot of very specific details. It's, it's he, he was supposedly a physician, which is written to uh, in a very exacting and clear and, and precise way of every every detail he could collect from every person he wrote into his work. So <clears throat> let's see. Uh, gospel of Hebrew in its cast, in its citations from the Old Testament, and in its whole bearing. Taking its keynote from the book of Daniel, the grand messianic textbook of Eastern Judaism at the time, and as re-echoed in the book of Enoch, which expresses the peculiar, or sorry, popular apprehension of Daniel's messianic idea. It presents the Messiah chiefly as, quote, the son of man, the son of David, the son of God. We have here the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophecy, the realization of Old Testament life, faith, and hope. 
Third in point of time is the Gospel of St. Luke, which, passing back another step, gives us not only the history of the birth of Yeshua, but also that of the birth of John, the preparer of the way. It is Pauline, and it addresses itself, or rather we should say presents, the person of the Messiah. It may be to the, to the Jew first, but certainly also to the Greek. The term which St. Luke alone of all the gospel writers applies to Yeshua is that of the servant of God, in the sense in which Isaiah has spoken of the Messiah as um, Edheb Yehovah, servant of Yehovah. St. Luke's is, so to speak, the Isaiah gospel, presenting uh, the Christ and his bearing on the history of God's kingdom and of the world as God's elect servant in whom he delighted in the Old Testament to adopt a beautiful figure. The idea of the servant of the Lord is set before us like a pyramid. At its base, it, it is all Israel. At its central section, Israel after the spirit, that is to say, when circumcised of the heart, uh, represented by David, the man after God's own, God's own heart, while at its apex, it is the elect servant, the Messiah. And these three ideas, with their sequences, are presented in the third gospel as centering in Yeshua the Messiah. By the side of this pyramid is the other, the son of man, the son of David, the son of God, the servant of the Lord of Isaiah, and of Luke is the Enlightener, the Consoler, the Victorious Deliverer, the Messiah, or the Anointed, the Prophet, the Priest, the King. So he's describing the way that um, the different Synoptic Gospels are looking. We haven't really got John yet. He's saying that John's going to be a lot like um, the ideas expressed in Philo. Yet another tendency, shall we say, want, remained, so to speak, an unmet, unsatisfied, that large world of latest and most promising Jewish thought whose task it seemed to bridge over the chasm between heathenism and Judaism. The Western Jewish world must have the Christ presented to them, for in every direction is he the Christ. And not only they, but the larger Greek world, so far as Jewish Hellenism could bring it to its threshold of the church, this Hellenistic and Hellen Hellenic world now stood in waiting to enter it, though as it were by its northern porch, and to be baptized at its fount, all this must have forced itself on the mind of St. John, residing in the midst of them at Ephesus. Even as St. Paul's epistles contain also as many allusions to Hellenism as to Rabbinism, and so the fourth gospel became not the supplement, but the complement of the other three. There is no other gospel more Palestinian than this in its modes of expressions, its allusions, its references. Yet we must all feel how thoroughly Hellenistic it is also in its cast, in what it reports and what it omits, in short, in its whole aim, how adapted to Hellenist wants its presentations of deep central truths, how, subtle, how subtlety, how suitably in the report of his discourses, even so far as their form is concerned, the promise was here fulfilled of bringing all these things to remembrance whatsoever he had said, John fourteen twenty six, It is the true light which shineth, of which the full meridian blaze lies on the Hellenist and Hellenic world. There is Alexandrian form of thought, not only in the whole conception, but in the Logos, and in his presentation as the light, the life, the wellspring of the world. But these forms are filled in the fourth gospel with quite other substance. God is not afar off. He is not uncognizable by man without properties and without name. He is the Father. Instead of a nebulous reflection of the deity, we have the person of the Logos, not a Logos with the two potencies of goodness and power, but the full grace and of truth. The Gospel of St. John also begins with better sheep, but it is the theological, not the cosmic better sheep. When Logos was with God and was God, matter is not preexistent. Far less it is evil. Or sorry, far less is it evil. St. John strikes the pen through the Alexandrianism, which he lays it down with the fundamental fact of the New Testament history that, quote, the Logos was made flesh, unquote. Just as St. Paul does when he proclaims the great mystery of, quote, God manifest in the flesh, unquote. Best of all, it is not by a long course of study, nor by wearing discipline, least of all by an inborn good disposition, 
that the soul attains this new life, but by a birth from above, by the Holy Ghost, and by the simple faith which is brought within reach of the fallen and of the lost. So he's saying that the, uh, the Gospel of John is putting forth these ideas that it would have been very uh, prevalent among the Greek thinkers of the time, but at the same time it's also very Jewish and mystical in the kind of things that it talks about. But it is definitely the type of document that is um, speaking to both crowds. It's speaking to the mystical heart of the Jew, and it's speaking also to the uh, to the deeper um, uh, philosophical revelations of the of the Greek mind. Philo had no successor. In him, Hellenism had completed its cycle. Its message and its mission were ended. Henceforth, it needed, like Apollos, its great representative in the Christian church. Two things the baptism of John to the knowledge of sin and need, and to have the way of God more perfectly expounded, Acts 18.24. On the other hand, Eastern Judaism had entered with Hillel on a new stage. This direction led farther and farther away from that which the New Testament had taken in following up and unfolding the spiritual elements of the old. That development was incapable of transformation or renovation, it must go on to its final completion and to be either true or else be swept away and destroyed. So what he's saying is, and this is the conclusion of the chapter, uh, next chapter will be five, this is the conclusion of chapter four. There's no one else who had similar thoughts to the way Philo expressed the best understanding of the religion to make it work with the Greek philosophical ideas of Plato and with that of the Stoics. Um, it required two things to, okay, let's read the last paragraph again. Philo had no successor, so no one came after him. In him, Hellenism had completed a cycle, so that was it. As far as it goes, well, that's, I mean, that's what he's saying, but he's saying as far as it goes for somebody trying to mix the two together um, in a complete and concise way, he's the last one who attempted to do it. Its message and its missions were ended. Henceforth it needed, like Apollos, its great representative in the Christian church, two things. So, the baptism of John to the knowledge of sin and of need, and to have the way of God more perfectly expounded. Of course, say first you've got to be baptized, and then you have to have the, the explanation given to you of what all this means. Now, of course, the question is, are we talking about the baptism in blood? which I would say yes. In other words, you have to be anointed with the blood of the Messiah because that's what happened at the cross, right? You have to step out on faith and say, ah, then this man who was dead is alive again because he did what God wanted. And then you get the teachings of God explained to you so that you can actually say, ah, now I know who I need to be. Um, on the other hand, Eastern Judaism had entered with Hillel on a new stage this direction led farther and farther away from that which the New Testament had taken in following up and unfolding the spiritual elements of the old. That development was incapable of transformation or renovation. It must go on to its final completion and be either true or else be swept away and destroyed. So saying that the teachings of Hillel became stronger and stronger. And you'll hear modern day rabbis will still talk about Hillel. And in the West, the teachings that grew into Christianity and the church uh, became more and more prevalent. And of course, they changed rapidly and quickly because when you've got a bunch of people who have a, an, an idea of how something works versus, like for instance, we're so fortunate today that we live in a time ever since the 1600s where the word of God is actually, because of the Gutenberg press, the first thing they started printing was the Bible. I mean, that's why, they, that's why the Catholic Church had the presses destroyed. They didn't want people knowing what the Bible said. So they start printing these Bibles, right? So we live in an age when we can actually go and read what the, I mean, we can read it in our own language, what the Torah says. We may not know all the intricacies. We may not know the, 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 the gematria. We may not know the, the three-dimensional understanding of the words. But we can read the basics of what it says. I mean, that in itself is a blessing and a gift. We can know the name of God. It's literally written in there. We, the Gentiles will know his name, and today they do, and we do know his name. Okay, 
That, those were huge gifts that were given to us in this modern age that we live. And now we even live in the age of the Internet where it's, it's taken a whole nother step where previously things were hidden in, in, in books and libraries that, Lord, you had to travel across the country into other countries to find. Now everything's at your fingertips. We're living in a time when we can find out about these things that have come from the past. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here reading a thousand-page book by a guy from the 1800s. You know, being broadcasted for years, this will be online, and whoever wants to watch it can come and watch it and, you know, read through this with me and be thankful that we live in the age and those things happen. Um, basically, what he's saying is that there was, a, there was a division that was coming. Either you was going to go Judaism with Hillel, which is rabbinical Judaism, which is pretty much what still exists today, or you were going to take the opposite path and end up taking the more Greek mindset thought and ended up in the, in, with the Christian mindset, which I agree that, that at, at, in the 1800s, I could see why he would say that because uh, it's only been very recently in the past, you know, couple decades that uh, unification is beginning to occur where I even heard Ben Shapiro say today, I was listening to him talk, he said that there's something going on with the Orthodox Jews and observant Christians where they seem to be coming together, uh, even as strange as that might seem. And I mean, I agree. There is, there is, the Ephraim and Judah are reuniting together. They're coming back together. Something, the separation that has been pushed between the people for so long is being closed. That gap's being closed. Uh, people are returning to the Torah. They really are. And, you know, even the ones who might say, well, I don't want to get Judaized, you know, give them, let them read that Torah a few times. Let them read them Torah portions. Let them go through the cycle of the Torah readings, you know, seven times. Let them spend time, let them go to Sukkot. Let them, let them feel what it's like to live as an Israelite and to understand why God said what he said, you know, and because he put, you understand it in your heart when you experience it firsthand and live it. Uh, let them experience that. And they'll, they'll quit with that. Uh, they, they'll know the difference between being Judaized and not being Judaized. That's, and Judaizers are people who, who taught the Haggadah and the Halakha. Those are people who tried to make you do things that were the, that put that put that wall around the Torah that wasn't necessary. We don't need a hedge of protection from the Torah the Torah is the hedge of protection to keep us from doing stuff that's stupid. You know, we need to know what the Torah says, and we need to we need to make it a part of our lives. Um, and again, what he's saying here is right around the time of Christ, there was a division coming, and it was showing up in Alexandria in Egypt, and it was showing up coming right out of Babylon with the teachings of Hillel. And you were going to see people who were either going to decide to go with the philosophical tradition and try to make that the foundation of their understanding or they were going to go with the oral tradition of Israel. And unfortunately, both of them are going to divorce themselves from what uh, it all started as, which is the Torah, which is why nowadays we're so fortunate to be in a time when things seem to be returning to the Torah. You know, it's like literally the, the simple, plain written word, almost like for some of us, it's like a reset button's being hit. You know, some, I'm sure there's plenty of rabbis that be like, oh, no need for me to reset. That's all I ever believed of what the Torah said. And that's why I study the oral Torah, so I can understand it better. You know, but for a lot of us Christians, it's like, we we got to, we we jumping back to square one. You know, we call Christ the, the, the stone the builders threw away. It's the Torah, the stone that the builders threw away. Christ is a living Torah. I mean, the, the builders threw the Torah away. Because they had to start making their own, they had to start making their own way. That's a lot of what Hillel did. He was making his Haggadah so that Israel could survive. You know, the idea of like uh, allowing the uh, uh, Jews to divorce without a writ of divorcement. You know, Moses said you have to give a woman a writ of divorcement. If you don't give her a writ of divorcement, there's no official divorce that's taking place. If you do that to her, Christ said, then you're committing adultery. That's what the law says. You have to obey the law. If you violate the law because some, you know, some rab, and that's the Aramaic term, there's a rabbi, which is a teacher, and then there's a rob, which is the, the big teacher or the man in authority over a region. You know, and some rob somewhere, like Hillel says, well, I think uh, it's okay. It's permissible for now for us to do this because that keeps us from getting into the involved in the Roman courts and we don't have to worry about 
you know, letting them in, take over our lives. You know, so we'll, we'll, we'll handle it in house. We'll allow it. We'll allow a, a new type of divorce. And of course, what does Yeshua say? If you do that, all you're doing is committing adultery. And then they say, well, what are we supposed to do? He said, well, he allowed you to, Moses allowed you to have a writ of divorcement because your hearts were hard. But I'm telling you, you shouldn't divorce. The, his, that was Christ giving them his Haggadah. He's like, the Haggadah is you don't divorce. The Halakha is that you can divorce. But he's telling you, don't divorce. Because that's not, the, that's not what God wanted. Just like he didn't want you to have multiple wives. But you can. But it's not what he wants. You know, if you really want to have a relationship with the Most High, you need to give him what he wants, not just what he'll let you get by with. You know. So that being said, we've, com we've completed chapter 4, and we'll start on chapter 5. Um, maybe I can put it up tomorrow, we'll see how this new microphone worked out. And chapter 5 is Alexandria and Rome, the Jewish communities in the capitals of Western civilization. And so even we're reading the life and the times of Jesus the Messiah, you know, you, I, are you hearing me? I'll say Yeshua every time I read it, but it's the life and times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim. And uh, he wrote two other really good books which is uh, that I have read, uh, which is uh, Sketches of Jewish Social Life and The Temple and Its Ministries, both of which are excellent. Much easier to read in this book. This thing reads like stereo instructions. The part of why I'm reading it with everybody is to help me read it too. So, uh, you know, Baruch, Yehovah, and... You know, if you're seeking the Most High God, then be blessed in what you do. Um, and uh, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. And please comment on it. Let me know uh, if there's any questions. Or if you just feel like I've completely missed the point, that's fine. Just tell me about it. Thank you again.